This clip is brought to you by SaveWithConrad.com. Talking about a rumble today that, well, we are not going to cherish forever. We're going in our way back machine, but not that far back, just five years ago. And I remember this one like it was yesterday. Royal Rumble 2015 went down on January 25th at the Wells Fargo Civic Center right there in Philadelphia, PA. That was, in fact, the 28th Royal Rumble. It drew a capacity crowd, or it felt like it, at 14,000 in attendance. But, man, the uh, the moving parts around this show and, you know, the, the debate was uh, a pretty hot topic amongst fans. We'll get into it. Let's talk about it. Daniel Bryan was out with a neck injury around this time. Tons of rumors that he's going to be coming back at the Royal Rumble. Meltzer would even say the return of Daniel Bryan at the Royal Rumble on the 25th in Philadelphia would, in theory, solve some WWE problems, but it could exacerbate existing ones. Bryan Danielson's career has been considered very much in jeopardy when, after what was thought to be a minor neck operation that would have him back in the ring in two months, wound up not regaining strength in his right arm to the point that his career was considered very much in jeopardy. Danielson was scheduled in August to undergo a second uh, neck surgery to attempt to alleviate the nerve problems that caused the weakness. And just before the surgery, his doctors advised against it. He has since been doing extensive rehab, acupuncture, and other treatments. But for several months, the strength didn't come back. And Danielson credited a doctor in Denver who he didn't name for repairing his problem that will now allow him to return to the ring. Uh, we didn't believe it at first. He said in an interview for WWE, it's one of those things where you're like, this guy's not for real, right? But he was for real. And then the doctors told me I was cleared and the inner circle in WWE, which didn't know if he could return at all, were aware that he was going to be able to return about three weeks ago. And the decision was made to have him start back at the rumble. So Arn, there's a lot to unpack here, but when we're talking about somebody having some, some neck issues, some back issues and you know, them not regaining feeling in their arm, man, some of that's probably resonating with you. Is it not? Well, if you want to talk about this subject, I'm your man. So when you lived it, when, when you hear that this is the issue, do you have a conversation with Daniel about it? I mean, you're uniquely qualified in this case. And you know, you had your career cut short to a very, very similar situation. You got a, your heart goes out to him in a time like this. I'm sure. Well, Daniel and I had several, and I would say probably more than several conversations. Every time I saw him, I would pull him aside, ask him how he was doing, ask him how his progress was. Let me see the atrophy, you know, and all those things, because he was living exactly what, what I live today and was living then. And all throughout that injury, it's a, it's an ongoing effort. Um, the difference was with Daniel is he met this guy in Denver and, and after going through this extensive therapy and I know the kind of guy Daniel Bryan is, I'm sure he did three times the rehab that he was scheduled to do because in our business, your product is your body right. and uh, you know, you got to get out there and, and, and put yourself on TV and you got to be performing and you're only as good as your last match. And you know, when he's in the back, it doesn't matter about where the target date may be to start back and all that, or it, it's more about how's your progress doing. And he had all these really negative situations where he met with the doctors and they're going, forget about it, forget about it, forget about it. And he just kept his nose to the grindstone and kept, you know, doing his rehab and doing all those things. And I guess this guy in Denver was a miracle worker. It's really remarkable that he is coming back. And, and most of our listeners remember he had, you know, set the wrestling business on fire at, back in 2013. He kept that momentum going into 2014. He was not the original plan for the main event of WrestleMania that year in new Orleans, but uh, eventually Vince acquiesced to the audience and they got their moment and quite a moment it was, but he came in banged up and, uh, that. That rain was cut short, much shorter than anybody would have imagined. And now we're still dealing with that. So fans didn't really get the closure on their push that they were looking for, or hoping for with Daniel Bryan. When you think back to 2013 and, uh, just to jog your memory, we had 
Daniel Bryan win the world title at SummerSlam that year, but then Randy Orton would cash in and immediately take the title with a little bit of help from Triple H. Um, and then famously, that WrestleMania is the one where when, when CM Punk learned of the creative, he decided to leave. When you look back on that time, is that one of the more pivotal moments in modern WWE history where you know, doesn't feel like Vince is listening to the audience or the office isn't listening to the audience and they're not giving them what they want with Daniel Bryan. And it's even creeping into the locker room when a guy like CM Punk says, that's enough. I'm out of here. What do you remember about that time? Just in the back and in, in within the company. Well, just skipping ahead before we go backwards, I would think if I'm CM Punk, I would look at Daniel Bryan as a case in point of looking into a crystal ball at my future. Right. I would think. Uh, now skipping back to Daniel Bryan, he was there was no magic to Daniel Bryan. You know, this is a this is an industry, and you know, it has a lot of fans that are very loyal. Um, those fans expect a lot, but they're willing to give a lot, and. Uh, when they see a guy like Daniel Bryan, who is not the biggest guy in the dressing room, not the strongest, but is the guy that works the hardest, work his way up from the bottom all the way, you know, through the indies, through paying his dues and all of those things and starting and going through the tough enough scenario and all that deal, Listening to the oh he's not short he's he's not tall enough he's not big enough he doesn't have a great body all those negatives that he had to fight through to get the people in his back pocket and it was just through hard work it was just Daniel Bryan was being a blue collar you want me to pay my dues I got no problem and he paid him and the audience got with it. And the groundswell started to pick up, and it was like a snowball rolling down a hill. It just, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And the people got with him, Conrad. To be honest with you, because he was just a hell of a overachiever and a hell of a performer. That's the only magic that he worked, and he gave it to them every time they saw him. He would go out and bust his ass, and that was the. Uh, that was what he brought to the table, and it worked. It was not a bunch of magic. It wasn't a bunch of smoke and mirrors. He wasn't turning an 18-wheeler over or anything like that. He just went out, and every time you saw him, he gave you a hell of a match, and that's what he brought to the table. Talk to me a little bit about you know the behind-the-scenes political situation. We've been led to believe as fans that you know certain voices behind the scenes sort of have their guys, and... I hate to use the term because it's associated with a, a manager and, and, a, and, a, and an on air relationship, but you need an advocate in the back almost. And, um, for whatever reason, sometimes that works. And sometimes it just annoys Vince, uh, to the point that he'll just go the other way, uh, just to piss off whoever that advocate is. Did you ever see anything like that with Daniel Bryan? Was there somebody behind the scenes who was really waving the banner for him saying, this is our guy. This is who we should be pushing here. Well, I know this, you had all the producers pulling for Daniel Bryan because we saw it not only at just television where you can look at TV with all the pomp and circumstance and all the stuff blowing up and all the wonderful lighting and all the great music cues and all that magic that you work to make a television show something special. When you get to a live event, you see what you really have. And there was no change with Daniel Bryan. When his music hit, the roof came off the place, all the way to the ring, they stayed with him throughout the match and they were with him when the match was over. And so we were all advocates of this guy's getting over the old fashioned way. He's earning it. And when you get over that way, you stay over. See, that's the that's the difference. There's no magic being done. And that when you take the magic away, you don't have anything remaining. Daniel Brown was a blue collar guy that was getting over because he was going out and grinding it out, and the audience was getting behind him, and uh, it was working. You know, there was always going to be those people, whoever they are. You know, you never have that conversation. Okay. Yay or nay, Daniel Bryan, 
can I show a hands? You know, that didn't, didn't right. occur. Sure. Uh, you know what I mean? Right. Uh, but you know, there's, there's always been this cosmetic thing with, with that company, with WWE cosmetics. It's almost the most important thing. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any future clips that we upload. We hope we made you laugh and we hope we can save you some money right now at savewithconrad.com.